So what about genetics? Going back to all of our classic behavior genetics approaches, this has been the psychiatric disease where there was the first evidence for a genetic component to it, the twin <coughs> studies, the Keddy adoption studies that we've heard all about, and what they have suggested was about 50% heritability for schizophrenia. And you're all over now what heritability means and what it doesn't mean. What you see within families is if you have an individual who has schizophrenia and they have an identical twin, the twin has a 50% chance of the disease. If they have a full sibling, about 25% chance of the disease. Half sibling, about 12%. Take a random person off the street, 1% to 2%. So there is a large genetic load. What you also see is in a, a higher than expected number of close relatives of schizophrenics are mild versions of thought disorder. And that's going to come in on Friday in a very interesting way. What this is saying right off the bat, it is not saying that all relatives of schizophrenics have these abnormalities, but they are occurring at a higher than expected rate. So that's old classical behavior genetics. Now, jumping forward a decade's worth of technology, how about molecular approaches, the version of just getting genetic markers? Not identifying the gene itself, but you remember this approach by now, where you were finding a stretch of DNA, and inside that stretch is a gene that is very pertinent to whatever it is, and the folks with the disease have a different version than the other folks, but you don't yet know what the gene is or where it is. So using this marker technique, some of the first disease gene markers came out in the mid-80s, late-80s for schizophrenia. And these were landmark studies, and everybody was incredibly excited about them, and these were really, really important, and there was a problem which is somebody would isolate a marker in, for schizophrenia in an Amish population. People love studying the Amish for things like this because they've got big families, because they don't have a whole lot of substance abuse, because they have very healthy lifestyles, and most importantly, because men, Amish men, who say they are the father of somebody or other are probably the father of the somebody or other. There's not a lot of messing around going on, and that's kind of helpful. You're trying to understand genetics, and if you don't even have the right person pegged as the father, that's going to make for some messy data. People love the Amish. People love inbred Icelandic fishing villages. These are all the folks who get studied, and in those years, out came some of the first genetic markers. And the problem was, each of the studies was getting a different marker, and nobody was coming up with any replication, a complete uninformative mess that was a major disappointment in the field. So very little happened in terms of the genetic marker approach. So we had to wait another decade or two, and now our current more modern version, which is forget a genetic marker, what about actual genes? Are there genes that have been implicated in schizophrenia where there are abnormalities, where there are variances in it. It comes in two different flavors, eight different flavors, our usual deal. We've already heard about one of these, which is variants in versions of this gene, coding for this enzyme that degrades dopamine, carries an association with schizophrenia. Nonetheless, very small effects. Interesting finding, and this was last year, these were three papers back to back in science from three different groups, all of whom used a very uh, contemporary technique for looking for genes, which is a SNP analysis, and it's really interesting and not in a million years could I describe it clearly, but using this very state of the art thing, they all had huge populations of schizophrenics, thousands of people in the study, great studies, and the amazing thing is that they all found genetic abnormalities, and they all found one in common with a huge effect, which was very, very reassuring until you looked at the gene, which made no sense at all. All three of these groups, superb scientists, reported that in schizophrenia, you have a higher than expected rate of abnormalities in 
genes of the major histic compatibility complex? What is that about? The human equivalent, wait, we're back at pheromones and individual signatures in the immune system. What is this about? Nobody has a clue. But a remarkable consistency in these three studies, they all found abnormalities in these major histic compatibility genes that have to do with cell signatures and immune defenses, all of that. And these were big effects in all three studies. All the studies were done superbly. People are just beginning to digest that one. Nobody really has a very clear idea. Some other genes have popped up as having mutations or a lot of variants where one particular variant is more associated with schizophrenia. And there's this one gene that's been found and replicated called DISC1. So what does DISC1 do? Nobody has a clue. And just showing how pathetic this whole finding is, what does DISC, D-I-S-C, stand for? Disrupted in Schizophrenia 1. That sure tells you a lot about what's going on. Well, what happens in schizophrenia? You have abnormalities in genes that are abnormal in schizophrenia. Let's party. So you got DISC1 and people trying to figure out it's got something to do with second messengers. Nobody really knows. There's not a whole lot that has been happening in this field that counts as progress. Really frustrating. People still need to make sense of this finding. One area, though, that's getting a lot of traction in the last few years goes back to one of our weird mutations from our macroevolution type lectures, that business of different numbers of copies of a gene. Macro mutations on that level, transposable events, gene duplications, a term we got back then is copy number variants. How many copies of particular genes? And the one thing that seems to be consistent is all sorts of genes in schizophrenia are popping up with abnormal numbers of copies of the gene rather than abnormalities in the gene itself. So that's really exciting. What's unexciting is nobody's replicating which the duplications are, and most of the genes, nobody has a clue what they do. People are flailing other than seeing there's all sorts of different genetic abnormalities that are popping up. How can that be? How could they all be relevant to this disease? Back one hour, it's not a disease. It's a whole bunch of heterogeneous ones, and there's going to be all sorts of different genetic components to it.